Hi, it is very early on Tuesday, November the 28th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the Colossians. Today it's Colossians 2, verses 16 to 23. That'll finish off the chapter. Um, yesterday, Paul was telling the Colossians, again, telling anyone who's reading the letter, uh, to not be taken in by philosophies and human traditions and, and empty uh, deceit. Stay focused on Christ. It's all about Jesus. All those lovely philosophies, those interesting things you play around with your mind, the traditions created by people. No. Don't, don't be fooled by those. Don't center your life on that. Center your life on Jesus. And he continues that theme. Um, so here it is. Colossians 2, 16 to 23. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you why do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. So, continuing, it really does, I mean, I maybe didn't have to stop reading yesterday. I could have included this yesterday because they are certainly together there. Don't be taken in by philosophies and human traditions is what uh, we heard yesterday. And it's more of the same. Um, clearly pointing uh, at, at, at first century Judaism. Um, or at the Christians who insisted on being more Jewish in practice, right? Mm -hmm. So don't let anyone condemn you. Don't let anyone tell you that you that you are not fit um, because you aren't keeping kosher because you eat what you want to eat. Don't don't, don't let them affect you. Um, you know, new moons and Sabbaths, uh, all that stuff. When he says there are a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ, I, I mean, there's a nod for, yeah, there, there's there's something in them, sure. But now that you have Christ, you don't need those lesser things, those things that are in, are in the shadow. I mean, yeah, they point to God, but Jesus embodies God. I think that's sort of what we're hearing in this letter. Um, and then, you know, then we go on with... Uh, don't let anyone disqualify you again. Say you're not good enough. Insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, but not holding fast to the head. <coughs> Excuse me. From whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. So your faith, as he says, should grow. Right? That, that seems to be evident to me. Our faith should grow, and it should grow from God. God. And very often I find that that there are people, and maybe even occasionally myself, who find faith an achievement. So I've done it. I've got it. I figured it out. Um, we're not, we don't recognize that, no, no, faith is meant to grow, always grow and change. So we're always learning, but, but the learning, as he says, should come from Christ, which should all come back. If we're talking about learning about God, then we're going to do that from Paul's perspective through Jesus. So again, it's, it's, it's digging deeper into Jesus. And what's interesting to me, of course, is that Paul rarely quotes Jesus' teachings, but focuses on, Jesus, on the event of Jesus, Jesus being in the human condition. Um, which I guess, I don't know, for me, becomes a challenge. If I recognize, as a statement of fact, that Jesus is 
is God dwelling in in the human condition. If I accept that, okay, done. But I don't want to achieve, right? I want to keep growing. Where do I keep growing with that? When I move into the teachings of Jesus, then I got lots of things to grow in because Jesus said some challenging things and did some remarkable things. Not just so, not just the event of Jesus, but the actual teaching, the ministry, the actions of Jesus as told to me in in the Gospels. And, and perhaps I, I, you know, from my perspective, perhaps I want to grow grow from there and look at some of the uh, some of the other Gospels, the ones that aren't included in canon, the ones that you know we 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 don't read, and some we don't read because they're. I struggle to say. It. I don't want to be dismissive, but some because they they're they're clearly they're clearly foolish. They don't they don't connect. They don't belong. Um, but others, they do. In the first century and beyond the first century, uh, there were a lot of gospels. It you know it takes us to about the fourth century to nail down and say, well, okay, the ones we're going to keep. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, we're going to keep these letters, and you know that's there. You go. There's there. There's our there's our gospel. There's our our, our Christian Bible to add to the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, but before they narrowed it down, there were others, and and interestingly enough, um, one of the ways that they discern the ones they'd keep were okay so you know, given the common experience of christ given this the stories told about, about about jesus these ones don't fit uh so we will we'll, we'll toss that out the infant gospel of thomas for instance I've, I've mentioned this before but it's probably been years uh has stories in it that are silly and don't really add any value uh, they, 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 they're preposterous. So as to say, no, those, those aren't, those aren't Jesus stories. They, they, they completely take us away from the Jesus of faith. Uh, the, the faith that we share as a community, you know, by the time we get to the fourth century. So no, they're not legit. So we toss those out. So there, and there were other gospels like the, that, 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 the gospel, um, the Thomas gospel, uh, the Thomas infant gospel, excuse me. But there is a gospel according to Thomas which is not a narrative gospel. It doesn't tell a nice story that you can follow like Matthew's. It's more of a collection of sayings. Um, and some of them are a little bit different than the sayings that we pick up in Matthew and Luke uh, and John. Um, seem to come from the same kind of source, perhaps, and have a slightly different perspective. And they were... they were That, that gospel was, was dismissed um, because it didn't fit that narrative pattern, perhaps. Um, or um, or some people didn't quite trust it, but I find that there is value in reading something like the Thomas Gospel or the Mary Magdalene Gospel, uh, which we have fragments. Um, and you know, as to why the Mary Magdalene Gospel doesn't make it in, well, you got to get into the whole discussion. Is Mary Magdalene an apostle? Because that was pretty important um, with, with, with the Gospels to, to associate them with associates of Jesus. Well, the Mary Magdalene Gospel is certainly associated with Mary Magdalene, but who is she in the in Jesus's ministry, right? And and there was always controversy. I mean, it isn't for much later. I mean, we got to move into history before Mary Magdalene becomes um, becomes a prostitute uh, in, in legend, or or you know the woman uh, who is healed from from uh, uh, many demons, um, the woman who is the go forth and sin no more, uh, about to stone her and Jesus steps in. That isn't clearly Mary Magdalene until later that becomes part of the tradition. So that makes her controversial. But there was always a controversy. <coughs> Excuse me. And the controversy might simply have just been the fact that she's a woman. But that gospel doesn't make it in. Well, if I'm going to keep trying to understand what it means that God is in the world, because to me that is the primary revelation of Jesus in if, if I take Jesus seriously, then I, I am accepting, uh, I am believing God is in the world. Well, some of those other Gospels are of interest to me. But I will always bring them back to Jesus. So when they take me away from Jesus, so if you were reading the Thomas Gospel and Thomas becomes 
Christ, then no. Which indeed might be the reason that the Thomas Gospel doesn't make it. I can't say. I don't know. But in the Thomas Gospel... It, it, it's it's a Gnostic gospel, uh, it's a mystical gospel, it's a gospel of sayings, but within it, it would appear that G, that Thomas has the mystical experience of God and becomes Christ-like himself. Doesn't die on the cross, doesn't do it for us, there's no, none of that, but the way he talks, there's a moment where Jesus, um, you, you remember when, when uh, perhaps you'll remember when, when, when Jesus says to, to, to the apostles, um, who do people say that I am? Uh, they say, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're a prophet, some say you're this, uh, John the Baptist. And they says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Uh, you are the Messiah. Um, so yeah, you are the Messiah. And Jesus goes, yep, you got it. I'm going to build my church on you. That same story told in the Thomas Gospel, Thomas says, my mouth has no words for you. I think that's right, something like that. And Jesus replies, I am no longer your teacher. So that's seen by some as that's, that's the moment that Thomas becomes Christ-like. By the way, part of, the, uh, part of uh, what the Thomas Gospel would suggest is that we all can become Christ-like through the mystical experience of God. So, using Paul's argument here, that may seem like it's not focusing on, on Christ. So that's a reason to reject it. I think that if the fundamental revelation of Jesus is that God is in the world, then I'm interested in reading things about God being in the world and how God is in the world. And God is in the world through me. Not that I am God incarnate, but God is present in me or I am present in God. That's interesting. So, I guess what I'm saying is that it, for me here in, in Paul, that, that this idea that that we should only focus on on, on on Jesus makes sense, but it can be limiting if we're not including the teachings and the life of Jesus. And as I say, Paul rarely does, so yeah, it's hard to know what he's what he's thinking about. But the point I think that Paul was making is that it all comes back to God in Jesus. And if it isn't that, then you're off making a mistake, right? You're, you're, you're off track. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, he says, then why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Um, you know, do not submit to the regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. So clearly here, again, we're, we're talking about, about, uh, about um, kosher law, uh, kosher tradition, um, regulations um, that refer to things that perish with use. Food doesn't matter, he says. It, it, it perishes. Uh, our bodies don't actually matter that much. They, they, they perish. Focus on, on, on that, which is forever. Focus on, on, on Christ. Focus on God. Um, Okay, so if this is, if I'm to read this as more than um, a criticism of those sort of the Christians who wanted to make Christians more Jewish, if, if this is more than just a criticism of them, I look at that and go, okay, so, so in my own faith, in the practice of my faith, in my relationship to my community of faith, Why am I so um, focused on the rules, the ins and the outs? I have seen churches divide themselves over uh, how to say the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, I have seen churches divide themselves um, over um, transubstantiation. You know, do, do we believe that the bread or the wafer or whatever our communion element is do we believe that it becomes the body of Christ or do we believe that it is a ritual, a remembrance of, of the Last Supper of, of, of Jesus? Um, you know, it, when I came up, in, in uh, grew up in, in the church, 
Uh, you could not participate in communion, the Eucharist, the you know the Lord's Supper. You could not participate in it until you were confirmed. Because confirmation, uh, in my tradition, really is the completion of baptism. We 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 practice infant baptism. So, uh, so I was baptized when I was actually I'm told I was two. Um, <coughs> okay, excuse me. I have no memory of it. Um, so I was baptized as as as, as a child. Uh, but I was confirmed when I was, I think, 14, 15 years old. That's when I confirmed my faith. That's when I took responsibility for my baptism, as it were. And then I was able to have communion, right? Um, yeah, I have, you know, certainly a, a number of friends, including my wife, uh, you know, who grew up Roman Catholic, who certainly remember their first communion. Um, so there were rules. You couldn't come to the table until you had a rudimentary understanding of how the table works, um, until you'd sort of hit a certain level within the faith. Uh, however, I am now part, so now my church uh, largely preaches an open table that invites everyone to come to the table, whether they're baptized or not baptized, whether they identify themselves as Christian or not Christian. Uh, and at any age, I am very happy to share the table with three-year-olds and four-year-olds, and ten-year-olds, and, you know, and the unbaptized. And I'm quite happy to share it with people of other denominations and other faiths. Uh, if they want to come, I, I, I serve them. Um, I invite them and I serve them. I, I don't want to speak for, for Roman Catholic churches across the board, and I don't mean this as a criticism. It's just a different way of being. Um... I go to mass. I used to go to mass a lot with my kids. Then my, my, now that my kids are in their forties, I don't go to mass with them so much. Uh, but um, but I used to go to mass with them a, a lot, and I do go to mass. And um, most Roman Catholic churches, in my experience in Canada, anyway, um, would say if you're not uh, if you're not a baptized practicing Roman Catholic, if you're not you know. Uh, well, I've heard the word used the word fit used. Uh, if you're not fit for communion, then then don't come, um, or uh, come forward, but um, cross your arms and and receive a blessing, not not the Eucharist, not not the wafer. Um, and then again, my 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 father-in-law, devout Roman Catholic. I mean, he would not he would not receive um, he would not receive communion. Uh, he would not receive the Eucharist unless he'd been in reconciliation unless he'd been in in confession uh within four hours of of, of the mass because he wanted to be a fit recipient for the body of christ so I, I think of the rules and regulations we put around the table i think about the understandings we have around the table uh and i read this and think well i'm not so sure that paul would be um impressed or or, or supportive uh, we have rules around things. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Be of the right age, be of the right confession, be in the right group. Uh, those things are human and perish with use, he would say. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels and dwelling on visions, uh, puffed up without a cause by a human way of thinking. So some of the things that we have come to imbue into our, into our, into our, into our rituals and or sacraments don't let anyone disqualify you. Um, stay focused on Christ, you know. And and uh, now, and, and and I say that, and I and I mean quite seriously, I have no issue at all um, receiving a blessing instead of instead of the uh, instead of the communion wafer when I when when, when I go to mass doesn't doesn't bother me at all because uh, I I believe I'm in Christ and I'm happy with that and and I and I do respect my. My hosts, I respect my friends, and that's their tradition. And so I don't want to cause controversy, so it's no issue for me at all. I do have friends, however, who get quite militant about it and upset about it. It's like, everybody's got rules. And what I read in this is try not to take the rules too seriously. Also, try not to take fighting against the rules so seriously. Again, these are all human things. Stay focused on Christ and and don't get don't get carried away by by one teacher or one perspective or one point of view because we're supposed to be in Christ and growing in Christ you know not in this denomination or that denomination 
not in this preacher or that teacher. Um, I mean, I, I think of, again, I don't mean this as a, as a criticism because I quite enjoyed uh, like Robert Schiller when I was a, uh, a young man. Uh, Robert Schiller was a, was a, a, a preacher uh, in the U.S., um, in California, the Crystal Cathedral. My goodness, I watched that on TV quite often, and lots of people did. In fact, lots, I remember lots of United Church folk, if they, you know, if they didn't come to church on a Sunday, they were probably home watching the Hour of Power, watching Bob Schiller. Uh, <coughs> but I can remember when Robert Schiller preached out of the Bible, and then I can remember later on when he would be preaching out of his books. Uh, tough times don't last, but tough people do, and all sorts of really good, lovely books full of lovely, good thoughts. But they didn't, they no longer seem to me to be Christ-centered. So for me, Paul would have an issue with Robert Schiller or the people who who, who flocked to Robert Schiller. And they, they thought of themselves as, as followers of Robert Schiller, not, not being in Christ, but being drawn to Robert Schiller. Um, people will, and they mean it as a compliment and as an identifier, you know, it's the same things like, you know, I really love belonging to Norm's church. And I know what they mean by that. And it's a compliment and it's lovely. And if you sit down and unpack it, what they'll say is, you know, what help, you know, Norm, you really helped me sort of understand what the scripture's saying, or you make it so easy for me to connect or whatever. Pardon me when I compliment myself for all sorts of good things. Anyway, they mean them as a compliment. Uh, but there's a little piece of it that cringes going, mm, it's not my church. <laughs> it's not my church. It's our community. It's Christ's church. And that's where our growth comes from. Um, it's not that, oh, Norman's so clever. It's, oh, no, it's it, it's it's the scripture so meaningful. Um, it's the experience of, of Christ within the community that connects me to God that's so meaningful. Uh, and you want to keep pointing to that. Um, and, and And Paul would be glad that, I struggle with that. <laughs> but I think Paul would also suggest that sometimes, um, you know, our focus on our own churches, our own communities um, can be a kind of self-indulgence. And, uh, and he warns against that. So, it's, you know, it's always about keeping it about Jesus. Now, I, I would also say that I can take Paul's words here um, seriously and then turn them back on Paul and go, okay, so I'm not agreeing with this letter. I'm not agreeing with your perspective. Um, uh, Paul's um, theory of the cross, the way he talks about atonement, the sacrificial cross. No, I'm not buying that because that's Paul, not Jesus. Right? That's Paul, not Jesus. Um, so if I stay focused on Jesus... It doesn't mean I reject Paul, but it does give me not only permission, but invitation to disagree with Paul, to struggle with Paul and go, well, wait a minute, no, no, I don't buy that. In the same way that I'm also invited to, to struggle with the gospel, you know, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, four different perspectives and they don't always align so I have to look at it and go, so where is Jesus in this? And how is this, how is this action of Jesus, description of Jesus, teaching of Jesus, whatever it may be, how is it connecting me to God? Because that's the point. I'm not meant to hero worship Jesus. I'm meant to see God. I'm not meant to get carried away with one gospel or, or one teacher. Um, I'm meant to stay focused on Christ. So if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John can help me, great. If Paul can help me, fantastic. But when they're not helping me, I don't owe them allegiance. The Apostle Paul is not Jesus. But that's hard for some Christians. It's hard for some of my colleagues. When we put Paul's letters in the Bible, the Spirit led us to do that. And therefore, we need to respect them. But if I'm going to really respect them, if I'm going to respect this letter, then I have to be careful of the self-indulgence of worshiping Paul and the and and the and the the and, and and following Jesus the way that Paul insists I follow Jesus, or understanding Jesus the way that Paul insists I 
I, I understand Jesus. Yeah. So, um, well, Paul, hoist by your own petard or pseudo Paul. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, you know, and I'm going to stop there. I'm starting to ramble a fair bit. And I think I've, I think I've wondered enough on this passage for today. So I'm going to leave it to you to, to wonder further. Uh, so let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to wonder. Thank you for the freedom that comes in, in faith. The freedom to not be bound by, by regulations or, or hero worship of any singular leader. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to wonder and, and in the wondering recognize you recognize you in Christ, recognize you as your word emerges in our wondering, recognizing you speaking to us in our lives, here and now. God, may we always listen for your word, and as we hear it, may we follow. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's enough for me today. Um... But until I get to see you tomorrow, God bless you. Please know that God sees you and knows you and loves you. And please, please know that God doesn't just surround you in love, but God's love moves through you into the world. And it makes a difference. You make a difference. So God bless you. I hope to see you tomorrow.